by calling 516-747-4070 or visit nassaubar.org. Once again, we continue with Law You Should Know. From the Mineola Law Firm of Shane, Dox, Denise, Corker, and Sauer, here is attorney Kenneth J. Landau. Hi, this is Ken Landau, and welcome back to Law You Should Know. We're talking about sexual harassment in the workplace, and our guest is Jeffrey Ettinger. He's a partner with Schwartz Ettinger, a law firm in Melville, Long Island, that handles uh, sexual harassment and all other issues on the base, uh, from the framework of employers. And Jeff, you were telling us about the different elements of s- sexual harassment and what an employer or employee should do if they think they're involved in it or they're aware of it. Can it is it something that uh, can be very subjective and cultural, people from other cultures or may have different personalities? What's going to offend one person, what's going to be a joke for one person is not a joke for another person. Or so, a negative comment. Right, okay. negative comment. Uh, a compliment that you think is a compliment is actually something that makes someone very uncomfortable. And what I always tell people is the workplace is a different environment than every other aspect of your life. And when you go to work, you should be neutral. You should treat people with respect. And you should always be cautious about your approach to other people. And it's it's the no fun zone somewhat where people um, say, well, I can't tell jokes. I can't send emails. And I always tell war stories about the number of times where people were joking around and it was probably funny. And then something negative happened in the workplace. And all of a sudden, all those emails live forever. And they have to answer to some of the things that they've done. And they simply can't. And if does it have to be, in terms of sexual harassment, does it have to be a verbal comment? Or Absolutely. can it be in an email or a text that someone sends even to a third person? Well, it certainly is. It can be in an email. And I, I've told the story many times of a client who had a supervisor who sent a uh, sexual joke to a coworker that they had traded a lot of emails over the years, but uh, things went negative and she brought a claim against the company. And this email was fairly graphic. And I said to the client, you will not be able to recover from this email because that's going to be exhibit A at trial. And if someone's telling someone a story about their weekend escapades and the person is an unwilling audience, Mm -hmm. is that implicitly could be, you know, some kind of sexual harassment? Absolutely. It's, It's any kind of sexual context that makes people uncomfortable in the workplace. Now, obviously, each case is subjective and a judge or jury could determine that that's not sexual harassment. But uh, they certainly could, and they certainly have in many cases. So, again, people have to be very cautious with their approach. They get comfortable with people that they work with. They do and say things that they just simply should not do. And those things are very hard to explain years later at a deposition or a trial that people are joking around and she, she knew I was joking around and we're friends. Uh, no one on a jury or a judge wants to hear that at that point. And what lessons can we learn from the allegations at Fox News for for victims, for employees, for others? Well, what we learn is as, as a culture is how scary sexual harassment can be when it's at the level at the top. Um, when the owner, high-level directors uh, are creating egregious acts of sexual harassment, the employees feel exceptionally helpless. Because although you have legal recourse, you're putting your reputation, your job on the line, and you can get blackballed in your industry, and a lot of people simply do not want to put themselves out there like that. So they almost accept sexual harassment uh, as a workplace requirement, and it's, it's so inappropriate. So what we learn as an employer is, it's always going to come back to you, even if you're able to settle it with lawsuits or put it um, under the rug, uh, make excuses for it. At some point, even the biggest company, even the biggest players, they will get caught in the wash and it will create huge problems for them personally and professionally. If someone's a bystander, they're not the victim themselves. Can they? Is it good for them to, to report something and should they be encouraged by employers to report something? Absolutely. Um, the, the, the idea is, is that everyone should feel comfortable coming to work. Men, women, uh, people of all different genders, races, national origins. And if you see something that you believe is inappropriate for the workplace, you should report it. Even with, if it doesn't directly yes, involve you. With the idea that you're trying to create a good workplace for everyone and that the employer 
should know about it and should be able to take steps to rectify it before it becomes a bigger problem. And perhaps you're trying to help the employer avoid a bigger problem or help the the person you think is being a victim. I think both. I mean, you, you the employer definitely should know and needs to know because if they can handle it at the smaller level, it does not blow up and become a bigger problem. But for the employee, they have to understand and some people have to get an education as to what's right and what's wrong and what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And the sooner they get that, the better off everyone will be because at some point they're going to cross a line that they cannot uncross and you want to get to them before they cross that line and the legal standards that you've mentioned do they apply in law in offices of any size well under federal law you have to have 15 or more employees to bring a claim under what they call title 7 which is a civil rights act uh, under state law you need four employees but under local law you, you do only need one so there's always going to be some place you can go to address your concerns and in terms of lit- litigation, what might some of the elements of uh, damages be to a plaintiff? If someone can adequately prove they were sexually harassed, they're entitled to compensatory damages, which is the amount of money they lost if they left the job or they were terminated. Uh, they're entitled to emotional damages, which is the essentially pain and suffering they had as a result of the harassment. And if the uh, jury determines that the acts were deliberate and intentional, uh, they could be entitled to punitive damages. And a key element also is uh, under federal law, you're entitled to attorney's fees. And if they left first but then claim it, they were forced to because of the harassment, they can they can absolutely make that claim later on. Absolutely. So the, 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 the damages are real, and they could be, in many cases, severe, especially if punitive damages comes into play. And do companies have insurance coverage that will help them pay the defense cost or pay any claims? They can. Uh, it's called Employment Practices Liability Insurance, and most larger size companies have it, um, but some companies have a large deductible. But um, in most situations, insurance will not cover intentional acts of wrongdoing, so any punitive damages claim uh, or finding would be on the employer. Do you recommend that employees and companies get this kind of coverage to help them? I do. And it, it, it doesn't mean that that gives them an excuse not to do proper investigations or to give sexual harassment training. But what it does is there are many cases of discrimination, harassment, where an employer will bring a claim uh, as an excuse for getting terminated. And unfortunately, with every law where there's great intentions in the law, people sometimes take advantage of that law. And this law is no different. There are many cases where people have not been discriminated against. They've not been harassed. But they say after the fact that they were because they're looking for money. So the employer needs to protect themselves from that. And it allows them to make appropriate employment decisions without the risk of hundreds of thousands of dollars coming out of their pocket. And sometimes they'll help educate you know, employees too, and encourage best practices. Sure. Well, in, in insurance companies, uh, everything is based upon uh, the, uh, a, uh, their premium is based on fa- a lot of factors, such as prior claims, such as employee handbooks, such as training. So, the more the employer can show that they're uh, doing things properly, the, the lower their premiums will be. We only have a few minutes left in the show, but in terms of resolving complaints, um, are they sometimes resolved through mediation or uh, arbitration? The reality is negotiation. That 95% of all employment law claims, especially sexual harassment, settle before trial. Uh, there's a lot of risk. It's a lot of time. Um, and truthfully, both sides get bloodied quite a bit in a, in a claim. A lot of allegations are made. A lot of people have to be called. It's a huge disruption of the workforce. Settlement is usually the preferred method, and usually it's through some form of mediation. Now, in this context, arbitration is rare because if you're not going to settle, the plaintiff would like their day in court, their right to an appeal, their light, right to have their case heard before a judge, and you lose that in arbitration. Well, sometimes you can have a high-low agreement, which will give you some recourse. Although you you, lose some of those rights. You certainly can, but um, one, a high-low in an employment setting is generally not preferred because it's kind of hard to determine the level of damages. But you're right. You, in many cases, lose your right to an appeal, uh, which in some cases you need. But many claims are mediated. I would say, like I said, about 95% settle before trial through mediation. Now, fortunately, the federal court system has a mediation process where you can go to a magistrate judge and they'll help you settle these cases for free. And if the employer is being sued, what are the elements that the best elements of their defense they can put forward? Well, they have to, one, obviously prove that the harassment did not occur. 
uh, if somebody was terminated, they can show that they were terminated for reasons other than harassment or a complaint that they made. A lot of times people just are poor workers. They don't show up for work. They're late. They do a poor job and they're terminated. And then after the fact, they'll file a claim for discrimination or harassment. On the flip side, can they also say they entertained the complaint, they investigated it, they tried to resolve it as best they could? Well, certainly if the employer can show that they did a proper investigation, issued a proper finding, it certainly helps mitigate the employer's damage. But again, if the act of harassment was by a supervisor or owner and a jury determines that there was actual harassment, the fact that they investigated the claim is only going to go so far. Any other final tips that you would offer employees, owners, or employees? The one thing I would say to employers is the bury your head in the sand approach that many employers have had or like to have in the present doesn't work anymore. Uh, You need to be proactive. You need to realize these claims are real. Uh, There's huge exposure. There's huge risk. And again, the, the effect on your workforce and really your bottom line are massive. And you need to get in front of these things. You need to really educate your employees on sexual harassment. You need to have appropriate policies in place. You need to have people within your company that understand the law so they can handle the claims appropriately. And in most cases, in most cases, it will save the employer a tremendous amount of time, money, and aggravation down the line. Does the employer almost need a zero tolerance policy? No, I mean, you have to be pragmatic about these things. Uh, Certain things, of course, are a zero tolerance policy, but uh, you're not going to fire somebody because they make one off comment uh, or send an inappropriate email. You need to educate and you need to realize that sometimes people are great people, great workers, and they make mistakes. Okay. I wish we had some more time, but I'd like to thank our guest, Attorney Jeffrey Ettinger of Schwartz Ettinger in Melville, New York. Keep in mind, whatever you've heard is presented as information only. You must get, whether you're an employee or an employer, you must get legal advice from your own attorney based on your own factual situation. You're listening to Law You Should Know here on Law You Should Know on 90.3 WHPC and also over the internet at ncc.edu slash WHPC. And most shows have podcasts available by searching WHPC on iTunes. Please join us next week at the same time for another program on Law You Should Know. 